2020, before the pandemic. It is great to see everybody back again, albeit masked. <laughs> so tonight we're running without, uh, without intermission, and because of it, I'm gonna do my quick announcements right now. Two weeks from tonight, in this very space, Windborn, great quartet, amazing harmonies, Come hear them, they're fantastic. They, they did a little to do at, at this year's virtual festival as well. And then on the 30th of no, uh, November, of October, is Reggie Harris right here on this stage. So, and he'll be fabulous. So you should know too, we're also streaming. So out there in Streamland, uh, hi everybody. And I won't say much more other than, you may have heard Jay and Molly at, Sw at Clearwater is part of Swingology, was that right? Yeah. Yes. And you may have danced to them, them playing. You may have been to Ashokan and gone to some of Jay, Jay and Molly's wonderful, wonderful programs. But they're here in this wonderful, intimate space tonight, and they're going to blow you away. So. <laughs> Well, we're uh, totally acoustic tonight, as you can see. And uh, how many folks have seen us live before? Okay, so uh, we're, we're trying out a different approach to an evening of music. But it's still live. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to trade instruments. No. 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 <laughs> no, we're not going to do that. Tonight, we're going to focus, for the most part, on uh, commissioned works uh, due to probably the uh, popularity of the of Ashokan Farewell and the Civil War series. Uh, over the past 30 years, we've been asked a few times to write music for specific things. So... Uh, We'll play some of those. And I want to remind people to let us know if you can't hear us, and we'll talk louder, or what? you can move up. I said, <laughs> be sure to let us know. Don't be, don't be shy about that. We, uh, we love to play acoustically and get the true sound of a true room. This is a nice room. They're not all this nice, but this one's a nice room. So we're looking forward to making music with no microphones tonight. So the first, uh, yeah. <laughs> These mics are for the stream. So um, let's see, we're gonna start with uh, Brother's Keeper. Uh, I'll talk about it in a minute, but first we're gonna play a little medley of fiddle tunes that starts with a song that we used for a dance scene in the film Brothers Keeper. Oh, a dance scene. Yeah. I'm just a fiddling. Oh, remember? I do. It's coming Good. back to me. All right. What, what year did we do this film? <laughs> 91. Okay. Blow 
I'm just fiddling, 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 fiddling around this town. Look out. Brothers Keeper. Uh, did anybody see it? Who's here? I highly recommend it. It's it's sort of a cult classic. It's cinema verite. It, in other words, it's not actors. Whoa. <laughs> There's no script. It is a story that unfolds. It's kind of almost like a documentary, real life. It's reality TV without the TV. Unless you watch it on your TV. Oh, that's true. Yeah. So, so there were four uh, brothers, the Ward brothers, in Munsville, New York. Uh, this was in uh, the 19, early 90s. Some of you know where that is, right? Munsville? It's not far from Stockbridge and the kind of <coughs> west of Utica kind of area. And uh, one of them... Uh, the oldest brother was dead in the morning, one morning, and um, the local DA decided to, um, uh, to accuse the next oldest brother of smothering him, uh, which, you know, it, it went to trial, it was investigated, etc. It, it didn't seem, he was acquitted, and that seemed the, the right verdict. But here's how we got involved in this. At that point in time, like all through the 80s, we didn't have a TV. And then we wound up doing the music for Ken Burns' Civil War series. So when it was done, he sent us, you remember VHS tapes, he sent us this whole box set and we got to watch all the finished product. But we didn't have a TV, so we bought this little tiny TV with a, with a VHS player in it and when I first plugged it in, you know, with the rabbit ears and all, it, it got the local news station. And on that uh, station at that moment, this guy, Delbert Ward, was being uh, let out on bail after spending a night in jail. 
for being accused of murdering his brother. So anyway, a few days later, we get a phone call from this filmmaker, Joe Berlinger, and he said, did you see that news story about Delbert Ward up in Munsville, New York? And I got to say, yeah, it's the only, <laughs> only news story I've seen in 10 years. <laughs> so he and his uh, partner, Bruce Sanofsky, asked us to do music for it as, and, and the film was being made as the story unfolded. So we decided to visit the community. They showed us a little bit of the early footage and the people in that community were amazing. And uh, we decided to go up and visit them and meet the Ward brothers. If we're gonna interject our music into their real lives, we wanted to make some kind of connection. So the morning after we got home, I came up with this tune that became the opening theme or the theme of the film. And on our album, uh, Waltzing With You, which is the soundtrack, this tune is called uh, Brothers Keeper Theme. But later in the film, it's, it has another name, Cows on the Hill. And that's kind of the version most people think about. So here it is. A little spooky. A little poignant, what else, a little sad maybe, yeah. <laughs>
So this community pulled together and raised, they had a, a potluck dinner to start with to raise money for uh, Delbert's defense. And at that event, the first event, they raised $10,000. This is back in the early 90s. And uh, you want to talk about Delbert dancing? Yeah, a little bit. Um, in the film, it, it shows this party that they threw together to raise money for, uh, for Delbert, because everybody had known him for decades, probably since he was fairly young, and um, they, really, they really wanted to support him. And Well, I won't give it away, but I, I will say that there was money to be had in putting one of the brothers in jail and sort of confiscating a lot of the land that they owned um, from them. They owned this beautiful hilltop out there that was um, starting to be worth a lot of money to people who wanted to build homes. Anyway, who knows what really went on in that story, but that's, that's one of the kind of background things that gets mentioned. But at this party that is to raise money for his defense, uh, Delbert is, is asked to dance, and it's obvious that he hasn't ever danced in his whole life. He's in his 60s. Uh, but in the film, you just see a little snippet of him dancing with the woman who asked him, and he's got this big grin on his face, and he's kind of, you know, figuring out how, how you move your feet back and forth to the music. It's, it's pretty sweet. So that inspired this music called uh, Waltzing With You, which is kind of a, uh, a, little, a little scenario of his life story and him dancing for the first time. And we discovered they like country music. So Molly wrote a country song for him. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For 
one more tune. Um, of all the brothers, and by the way, part of the story is also that these guys uh, couldn't really read or write. They were, they were uh, very unusual. They, they lived in a, all lived together in a, a house that was really more of a glorified shack. And uh, the filmmakers, because they only had an outhouse, but they didn't have running water, the filmmakers at some point along the way decided to spend some money and improve their living conditions. And so uh, they financed the building of a, of a flush toilet in the home. And they weren't there when the work got done. And the, uh, the boys, the, as what they were called locally, decided that it should be in the kitchen. Because <laughs> that's where the plumbing was. And, and they had a big old farmhouse kitchen, you know, like, well, it, not as big as this room, no, but, but very big, right? I don't think so. Remember, oh, the whole yeah. house wasn't as big. The as whole house room. wasn't that big, but <laughs> compared to the other rooms, it was big. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and then as time went on and the visits kept going, the uh, toilet became a television stand. <laughs> they really enjoyed the outhouse more. <laughs> so anyway, the, one of the brothers, Roscoe Ward, I always can see, he's my favorite. When you see the film, they've all passed on now, but we did visit them a couple of times after all this too. And uh, he, uh, he's got to be the cutest old guy ever, you know. And at one point, uh, they're filming a, him telling stories. They're by a waterfall, and he's talking about when they were all young, and they'd have these parties and uh, drink beer and hang out with their friends by this waterfall and saying, oh, yeah, those were great times. So um, I wrote this tune while I was stacking wood one day. It just came to me, and we used it for that waterfall scene where he's reminiscing, and uh, unfortunately, the scene was cut from the film, and the tune never got in the film. But we put it on the soundtrack album because we had <laughs> recorded it. And that's one of the interesting things about doing music for film. Sometimes it doesn't get in there for whatever <laughs> reason. So here it is. This is called Roscoe's Waterfall. <laughs>
still back in the 90s, uh, this company called Rabbit Ears uh, asked us to do music for a, a children's film, book, and story that would be uh, narrated by Angelica Houston. And it was the story of Rip Van Winkle and being a kind of Catskillish musicians. At that time, we were actually also the uh, under a grant from composers, Meet the Composer, we were composers in residence for the Catskills. Uh, so we're asked to do this, uh, the story of Rip Van Winkle. And uh, Mo, you wrote this tune for the opening of the film where they, they talk about the Hudson River and uh, Henry Hudson uh, sailing up it for the first time. Right. You know what they didn't say, I don't think? I don't think they said that it was called the, the North River for, for a long time before it was renamed the Hudson. And that was a rename from Mahikanata, I right. believe. Right, right, the original name. Yeah. So but that's okay. Uh, we're gonna see if we can stick a medley together that we've never played before <laughs> of tunes from this film, let's see. So, Silvery Hudson and yeah. Chuck. Okay. All right. So we all know the story. Rip Van Winkle wanders off into the hills. He's kind of a ne'er-do-well. He likes to fish and hunt. He has his dog with him. He meets these characters who give him a lot to drink. He sleeps for 20 years. He wakes up and the world is not what it was. I feel like that now. <laughs> What happened to the last 20 years? So uh, th we used a tune that I had already written for dance as a dance tune called The Wizard's Walk for the moment where he kind of spirals out of control in a stupor and then eventually falls asleep. But the wild stupory part is The Wizard's Walk. So we'll go from Molly's uh, Silvery Hudson into The Wizard's Walk.
close them? I can do that. Just ask how the sound is. Oh. That's good for everybody. How's the sound? Should we talk to the sound person? <laughs> no? <laughs> you can hear us? Good. Great. Okay. And, and, and out there on the internet, can you hear us? I hope so. <laughs> it's good to be, you know, in many media at once. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, we run these music and dance camps at the Ashokan Center, and some years back, probably in the late 90s, it's hard to remember now, wow, listen to that lonesome whistle blow. I love that. George Blossom special. Yeah, there it is, there it is. Nice one. Um, that I was called into the office. Uh, there was somebody on the phone from Los Angeles, and it was James Horner, the film uh, composer. Uh, and he was uh, working on music for the film Legends of the Fall. And the uh, filmmaker, uh, Ed Zwick, had asked him to imitate me. <laughs> <laughs> And th at that point in the 90s, there were many people imitating Ashokan Farewell, mm -hmm. and that style of music, it, it had become a thing. And uh, he, the, James Horner was the first person to ask me to play it, play the music he was writing. It, it was a, a real honor, frankly. Um, and uh, he, he treated us amazingly well. Um, the, uh, the idea was he had written four themes for the members of the family. Did anybody see that film, Legends of the Fall? Yeah, it, it was Brad Pitt and Anthony Hopkins and a variety of other people. And um, these four themes are beautiful fiddle melodies and uh, three of them are waltzes. And so um, I was gonna play, you know, melody on all these with the London Symphony Orchestra at Air Studios, which was George Martin, the Beatles producer's recording studio in London. And uh, James Horner flew the two of us to London first class. A limo picked us up in our home on the day we had to leave, like in, in the Catskills. And, and then when we landed, it, in London, a limo picked us up and took us to a health spa where we were massaged. And <laughs> really, this we happened. Went swimming. We went and swimming, swimming and hot tub and all that stuff. And a lovely little apartment they gave us. And he uh, very kindly asked me to come in every day, whether I was playing or not, so I'd get paid for each day, which was a treat. And we got to sit there and listen to all this, and uh, one day he said, I want you to meet some people. So I come over to meet these three, they were these three guys, you know, older, like us now, you know, <laughs> in the corner, and I wondered who they were. And the first one was Larry Adler, the harmonica player, and so I got to meet him, and then George Martin, the studio owner, and then, hello, I'm Chuck. Tony Hopkins, like all these guys came to the sessions. It was an incredible experience. Anyway, we're gonna play the melodies for you now. Shall we? Yes, uh, I'll just go to the floor. Okay, <laughs> this is, this is a, uh, a challenge. This, this is a thing that we don't do very often and it's been a lot of years since we, uh, you know, yeah. since we were there doing that, so. Okay, so what, so the, I don't um, even know how it starts. Let's see. Morning. Oh yes, thank right. you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Don't, I think we're jumping into the 80s now, maybe <laughs> in the late 80s. Um, Where were we before, in the 90s? I think so, Early it's hard 90s? to remember. Back to the, uh, back, oh, no, no, I, uh, 1990, yeah, 98, 99, that's when this was. Okay. Okay, yeah, late 90s. Um, a small record company, uh, the guy who ran a small record company in Nashville had been driving through the Midwest during harvest season. You know, everything was lush and corn was being harvested and what have you. And he was in his head imagining our music. And he, he contacted us. He had this idea of commissioning a chamber orchestra work that would follow the, the four seasons. Apparently, he'd never heard of Vivaldi. <laughs> So, uh, but the idea would be the four seasons on an American farm. And so fiddle music was, was the right thing. And he commissioned this work and it would be for an album on his label. So he hooked us up with uh, the Nashville Chamber Orchestra. That's where the label was located in Nashville to be the performance entity. And uh, one of their members is an amazing orchestral uh, um, arranger and composer. And she partnered with us to help orchestrate our ideas. So we worked on our versions and we'd send them and it went back and forth over the internet. And then we completed this 20 minute suite. And it was uh, a lot of work and a lot of fun. and, and it, a series of concerts were scheduled in the Nashville area. One was going to be on performance today on public radio, and another would be uh, the actual recording for the album. And uh, about 10 days before this was all to happen, I got a phone call from the head of that record company, and he said that uh, they had just had an intense audit and it turns out they're bankrupt and going out of business. And all the cons the whole thing was canceled. And 10 minutes later, my daughter Ruth, who was working for a friend of ours who had just bought, no, he was looking at a mountaintop retreat near Ashokan, uh, 40 acres in a 24,000 square foot rambling summer place that had been owned by a very uh, well-to-do family built in the 20s. And he wanted me to drive up there, meet him, and play the violin in these big rooms. He was going to convert it into a recording studio. He wanted to hear the acoustics. So I drive out there, and I find it. It's a foggy day. And we're up on the top of the mountain. And uh, he bought it, basically, on the spot. He, wow. he said he, he didn't like write the check that day, but he made the deal. So we're on our way down the two and three quarter mile driveway <laughs> down toward the Ashokan Reservoir. And I start telling him the story of what I had just, this phone call. And he said, okay. I said, okay, okay, what? I'll, I'll finance the record. <laughs> what? <laughs> Thank you, my friend. So uh, he put up the funds, and we were on the label Angel Records. So I also brought it to them, but it was going to take them weeks to make a decision. And eventually they did buy it, and he got reimbursed, and it all worked out. And we recorded it with the Nashville Chamber Orchestra. So. Molly, you wrote this song to open I to did, to but open I, the album. I did hope that this is a cautionary tale about decimal points to people because that first record company, that was their only problem is they had their decimal point in the wrong place. <laughs> As it turns out, they thought they were fine, but they weren't so fine. So anyway, this song opens up that, uh, that recording, that album, Harvest Home. And it, um, it's a song that I wrote remembering stories that my mom told me about growing up on a farm. She grew up during the Great Depression. She grew up in Washington State, where I grew up. 
and I actually grew up about 15 minutes from this very farm where she grew up. Um, but she would, she would tell stories about farm life and how fun it was to collect eggs from the chickens and do this, that, and the other thing and, and uh, feed the horses and, uh, and never feel like there was anything wrong financially because they always had plenty to eat and lots of friends to come over and help them. When, um, when the season came to you know, go out and do all the work, gather up things. So it sounded like a pretty idyllic life to me, even though it was very hard times, obviously. But I wrote this song called Bound for Another Harvest Home, um, just talking about the seasons on an American farm. The chorus always starts with bound for another harvest home and ends with bound for another harvest home. So please join me on that. I hope I hear you singing. There's, a, there's another little part that repeats, you'll get it. It's, we'll dance to changing rhythms as the seasons come and go. It's the second line of the chorus, happens each time. So, good. Very important farm knowledge is how to tune a mandolin properly. Jay, you went to ag school, didn't you? I did. That's where you learned how to tune a mandolin. Yeah. <laughs> While he's at it. Here we go. When it's springtime in the Catskills With a thousand shades of green the farmer bows to wake the earth from its dark and ancient dream. Each seed has a perfect plan in harmony with earth and man. And they're bound for another harvest home. summer afternoon the farmer bows and bends among the ropes that run forever his precious crop he tends the fruits of all his labor here will feed his family through the year till they're bound for another
Thank you for singing on that. Should we do the sweet melody? I think so. I think that'd be nice. See how that's going to sound. Okay. Okay, well, we're going to play some of the th seasonal themes. Um, I do mention that Vivaldi ignored a season or two. One important season that he didn't touch on is Mardi Gras. <laughs> so uh, we're going to play, uh, we'll, we'll end with the Harvest Barn Dance, the hot, toil, sweaty, mosquito-ridden summer right before that, and uh, spring on the prairie is pretty much the opening, but there's just this very short, painfully poignant melody at the top before spring opens up, and that is morning after Mardi Gras. <laughs>
just looking at our little list here. Well, while yeah. you're doing that, I'm going to remind people or tell you for the first time, depending on if you know it or not, that every Wednesday evening on Facebook Live, Jay and I do a concert from our home, from our little living room. And if you do Facebook, you can check it out Wednesdays at 8 p.m. at Jay and Molly. Yeah, that's our Jay it Unger is. and Molly Mason Facebook site. I don't know that much about Facebook, so. But we're there. But we're there. I do know that. And we uh, sit in our living room corner at our piano and have guitars and mandolins and banjos and fiddles hanging about. And Jay picks up every kind of instrument and we have fun. You've played a bass on it. I have played a bass on it as well. You never know what you're going to see. He also has played bagpipes on that. So it's kind of a, it's a, li it's a little surprise every Wednesday night for us too. And because it's Facebook Live, you could turn it down if you want. <laughs> when the bad pipes. Come. You can turn it completely off if you want. <laughs> you know, I was thinking, there are going to be a lot of waltzes tonight. Could we do um, your waltz that, that's in the film, The Divide? Do you want to get up to that already? or? I do. Okay. We can go different. We have to be chronological. Okay. This, right. is a, this is our most recent uh, soundtrack work, a film called The Divide, written, uh, written and starred and directed by uh, an actor named Terry King. And uh, it's a story that it's a, a Western that takes place in 1976 in the High Sierras on the Great Divide. And uh, the uh, star of the the main character is a guy in his early 70s who's beginning to experience Alzheimer's, but nobody's named it yet. It's, you know, just a guy Maybe getting older is. is what people think. And he lives alone on this farm. He has farm, he has farm, he has farm, he has a man who's sort of a, a footloose drifter and a strange daughter, a grandson he's never met, a very dysfunctional situation that comes together quite beautifully by the end of the film, which is why we agreed to do it, by the way. <laughs> Lifting and beautiful. So it's called The Divide. <clears throat> and this is Molly's theme for uh, the daughter of the film. It's a, a tune that had come together many years before, maybe 10 or 15. And I actually wrote it for my homeland, which is out west. It's called Call of the West. But it really fit into this California farmer 1970s film. So we used it there.
have the guitar, I have the fiddle. I said there are going to be a lot of waltzes. <laughs> can we try Liberty's Golden Shore? Yes, we can. Let's do that. Yes, we can. Have to think about of, it for a second. I'm looking at a list of things and trying to fit them all together. So, um, I don't know when this was, but years ago, the uh, South Street Seaport Museum uh, decided to talk about their own history. And uh, prior to Ellis Island, South Street Seaport was the port of entry for many, many millions of immigrants into this country. And so they wanted to celebrate immigration in America. And this was uh, many years ago before it was the kind of hot button topic that it is today. So we were uh, commissioned by them to put, to create a, an album and to write a piece of music to uh, commemorate, celebrate uh, immigration in America. Now both of us descend from immigrants, your family two generations back. Is there anybody here who didn't descend from immigrants? <laughs> Well, probably my, not. I'll talk about my family. Okay. Oh no, I'll, just briefly. Both my parents were born in Europe and came here, you know, separately. My mom from Turkey, my dad from Hungary, by ship, uh, as very young people. And so this tune is called "Liberty's Golden Shore," and it kind of portrays a sea voyage. Some of the, let's say, uncertainty fear and excitement of what's going to unfold in the new world. And then at the end, you kind of feel the ship rocking into, as it docks into the port. So here it is, Liberty's Golden Shore. Sorry, Jay. get it in tuner, it won't dock, you know what I mean? <laughs> All right, close enough. Beautiful.
So uh, occasionally uh, one or both of us commission a tune from ourselves. <laughs> and this next one. Uh, Usually I can't afford it, I gotta say. <laughs> this next one I wrote for my mom and my, my uh, ancestors on that side of the family. Sephardic Jews from Monastir, Turkey. It then became Yugoslavia and now it's, it's uh, Macedonia. It never moved, of course. <laughs> and uh, in 1913, my great grandfather sent his three children and their spouses and, and their kids with his savings. He was a winemaker and a grape grower. He sent them to America. He was in his 40s and he, this family story is that he thought he was too old to change his life at that point. So he stayed. But um, 30 years later, in 1943, the Nazis took over the area and he and the remaining 3,000 Jews in Monastir were all shipped to Treblinka. That was the end of that. There are none there now. Well, a more uplifting part of the story is they came here in steerage and um, you know, the culture involves yogurt and goat's cheese and all that kind of stuff. And uh, because they were not, you know, in fancy cabins, they were in steerage. The story in our family is that they were able to bring a goat and make yogurt on their way over and keep their culture literally alive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I still make yogurt today, but it's not the same culture. I wish I had those same bacilli or whatever they are. So here's the tune. It has some of all the story and emotion there. And also knowing that the family were grape growers and winemakers, there must have been some partying and dancing over those hundreds of years that they uh, lived in peace in that part of the world. Can you face me just a bit? Sure. Just, you, you can be up there if you want. Okay. Tell me where to stand. Because I can't be any further back than this. I'll come this way. Okay. That's good. That's good. Yeah. It's good. Is this good? It's great. <laughs> That's fantastic. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
can't stay much longer. People need to get up and move around. Oh, they do? They do. Yeah. They do. Would anybody like to stand up now for a moment and turn around? <laughs> no, apparently not. That's okay. That's okay. The guy who wrote the Hokey Pokey, when he died, they put him in the coffin and they stuck his right foot in. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. So, um, I, I have a request from you. Really? Soon. Okay. Yeah, it's a little tune about the garden. Okay. Will you do that? Yeah, is there anything else that we wanted to do before then? Oh, not the divide? No? No, I don't think we're going to be able to do All that. All right, what else is on that list then? Yeah, you can look at it. It's boring for people to watch <laughs> them. Does anybody have any requests? <laughs> See? Oh, that's nice, that's yeah, nice. It's going to be too long. Is it? Is it going to be too long? This and this, we're kind of done. Maybe okay. All right. All right. All right. Okay. Is it? Here's a question. New medley. A medley. We'll a make one up. Big later. medley. Yeah. <laughs> um, is it time to sing another song? Yeah. We haven't done a lot of singing tonight. Let's do it. Too much fiddle music, not enough singing, right? <laughs> no, not really. Just enough fiddling. And now we're going to have a little more singing. Um, I want to do this very seasonal song because in another few weeks I am not going to be able to perform it anymore because it's too sad. And I'm talking about this wonderful song about the greatest thing in the garden, those round red things. Tomato. Yes, of course. Homegrown so, tomatoes. So, uh, Repeat after me, homegrown tomatoes, homegrown tomatoes, what would life be without homegrown tomatoes? Oh wait, wait, start when I start. Here we go. Home, 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 home tomatoes. What? What would life be without homegrown tomatoes? There's only two things that money can't buy, and that's true love and homegrown tomatoes. There's only two things that money can't buy, and that's Yes, you all get an A. That's excellent. <laughs> Song by Guy Clark. Well, there's nothing in the world that I like better than making me a sandwich with a homegrown tomato. I'm up in the morning, out in the garden, where I pick me a ripe one, don't pick a hard one, plant them in the spring, and eat them in the summer, winter time without them, a culinary bummer, forget all about the sweating and the digging, each time you go out, to pick you a big one, what, home?
participation there. Thank you. Yeah, so it's time to play the tune that we usually play at the end of our show. Oh, already? <laughs> it is. Okay. It is. is. Is it like getting to be a bad, yeah. Yeah, I been guess doing so. We've this for a while. Time flies when so you're having fun. This is the tune that led to all those commissioned works because of how popular it became and how well, it fit into the Civil War series, but I didn't write it for the Civil War series. I was, um, I wrote it just personal, you know, it was how I felt, how I felt, how I felt, how I felt, how I felt. summer of music and dance camps at Ashokan in 1982. They're still going, so they're, it's been more than 40 years now. Back then, no one knew if it would happen again each year. I guess we still don't know. It's one of those things. But uh, this tune came to me, and uh, it was just, I, I didn't play it for people at first because it just teared me up every time I played it. And I was unsure of what was going on with it. But eventually I played it for our bandmate, 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 bandmate. When we were finishing the second album, there was one tune, a slow one, <clears throat> that we were not happy with. And we had the whole album finished and mixed and this one unusable slow tune. And uh, Russ Barenberg, the guitarist, said, why don't we try that new waltz of yours, which didn't have a name yet. And we recorded it pretty much in one take. And uh, it became a Shokin farewell. <laughs> and we sat back and listened to it and felt like Wow, this is something. And we kept using it to uh, close our sets or as an encore number. In the, uh, during the early 80s, Ken Burns heard the uh, LP, remember those, and uh, asked us to start working on some of his early films because he loved that sound so much. And then this became the theme of the Civil War series. So it means different things to different people and we hope it touches you in some way. And we're very grateful for the opportunity to be here this evening. We are, thank you. And, uh, and, and launch this season and the first streamed concert. And uh, uh, it's really, th these concerts have been going on for many years and it takes volunteers to make this happen too. So let's hear it for those folks. Dedicated. <laughs> thank Joy for inviting us, Chris, everybody who is involved here and makes these happen. Thank you. And I will mention one more time our Facebook Live things on Wednesday at eight o'clock. At um, it's called the Quiet Room. That is our little broadcast that we do every Wednesday. Jay Younger and Molly Mason Page. So hope we see you there too.
What should it be? Something live? Mm -hmm. Lover's Waltz. Lover's Waltz. Wow. Into. Yeah, stay in G. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Just John Howard's or something. Or, okay, one of yours. Maybe. We're gonna make this up. <laughs> <laughs> we already made up the lovers' waltz. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs>
Thanks for Winborn and get home safely. Be well and be safe. Thank you. Thank you.